This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So, um, almost every year I <clears throat> present you a summary of our current uh, research. And uh, so I'm going to do it the same. I thought for the first slide that would be a tiny bit playful. I wanted to sort of compare, you know, producing a great wine to a clinical research trial. And I realized that, you know, the Vintners has uh, lots of challenges, the weather, the rain, the pests, the birds that come and nibble on the grapes. And I felt, you know, that when I do a clinical trial these days, I'm dealing with the same challenges. It's getting worse. Uh, IRBs are getting more difficult. Uh, there are newer committees that want to look at your uh, design of the study. There is a committee on the Medicare cost analysis to make sure that all the budgets is in the right place. Uh, there is a nursing committee that has to also approve your, your clinical trial, and so on and so on. Uh, so uh, I, I think when I retire, I may be more successful and I may have an easier time planting grapes and making great wine than these days getting a design of a trial and finishing it and uh, sending it for publications. So the, uh, I don't want to go over a litany. I, I know most of you, whenever I talk to you every year, uh, like to uh, understand the uh, mechanism of action of the drugs and, and, why, and the rationale, rather than going through a litany of all the studies. So I want to briefly, though, uh, summarize three areas that I'm going to discuss. One of them where we're putting uh, emphasis is to optimize the outcome with co-stimulation blockade. The number two is um, UCSF uh, is really entering a new era of modulation uh, of vis-a-vis of, uh, -vis the allograph with Treg infusions. And then, uh, uh, since most of you see patients with FSGS, I wanted to give you an update on uh, this whole issue about podocyte injuries and all the newer mechanism of actions that have been uh, uh, published lately. So, you know, Belatacep, uh, when it was approved a couple of years ago, uh, was looked upon as a breakthrough drug because it, it did uh, uh, inhibit a very critical pathway in the activation of uh, the immune cells. And it had many of the characteristics of what we would be uh, considering as desirable for, for a great drug. It, sust it improves sustained improvement GFR, it decreased development of donor-specific antibodies. These days, late after transplant, half of the kidneys are lost because of antibody-mediated rejection. Lower risk of cardiovascular disease, well, half of the patient uh, uh, who lose the graft, lose the graft because they die prematurely from cardiovascular events. Uh, improved compliance, a major problem. I mean, every few weeks we have a patient who's admitted uh, with rejection, frequently irreversible rejection uh, because of non-compliance. And of course, once you address many of these factors, you do have uh, the potential of increasing long-term survival. However, I think if you see many of your patients who come back after transplantation, and you see them in, the, in your clinics, uh, you notice that many of them are still on CNI. Uh, so in many ways, Belatacep has not yet fulfilled its potential as a transformational agent uh, in, uh, in the transplant field. And just very briefly again, uh, to refresh your memory, uh, that activation of the T cell requires two signals, signal one, which is the antigen, and signal two, uh, which is a, through the co-stimulation uh, uh, pathway. And if you don't uh, deliver uh, to the T cell co-stimulation, only antigen, the T cell doesn't get activated, it doesn't proliferate, doesn't produce cytokines, and undergoes apoptosis. And uh, Belatacep is a second generation CTL4IG. 
uh, a receptor fusion protein that binds with high affinity to the two ligands, CD80 and CD86. They also are referred to frequently as B71 or B72. And therefore, uh, co-stimulation with CD28 does not occur. So these are, uh, this is a, a protocol of the two phase three trials that registered the drug. Uh, one was called Benefit, and uh, uh, it enrolled patients who received standard criteria donors or kidneys from living donors. And the Benefit X uh, uh, that enrolled patients who received ECDs. Uh, the, the, I'm showing you the two main components of the trial, the patients who were on cyclosporin as uh, um, the control arm, and the patients who were treated with belatacept. This is the lower intensity regimen that got approved by the FDA. And all patients received induction with basiliximab and an, an anti-L2 antibody and were maintained on MMF. So the, uh, this is one of the trials. I don't have enough time to show you uh, all the specifics, but with the latter supply uh, intensity regimen, uh, while the efficacy failure, which take in consideration patient death, graft loss, uh, loss to follow up, uh, was comparable in the two groups, but the belatacept patients had, as you can see here, a high rejection rate. Uh, what also was important that when the patients had rejection, histologically with belatacept, the rejection were more severe. And this is a projected uh, graph half-life uh, uh, taking, this is a, a, based on the risks of the patients and their uh, um, uh, several factors that include age, GFR, et cetera, that at three years, when one compared, uh, when this group, sorry, compared patients on Bellatus versus cyclosporin, uh, on a risk-adjusted model that they had developed, they could predict that over the subsequent seven years that the patients treated with belatacept would have two extra years of craft half-life, which would be an important prolongation. Now, uh, why, does, uh, why hasn't then belatacept fulfilled the promise? Okay, there were more PTLD in the phase three studies, but the PTLD were predominantly due to the fact that if the patient was EBV negative, the risk of PTLD was actually 8%. So now when the FDA approved the drug, and of course when uh, any transplant physician chooses to use this belatacept, it's only in patients who are known to be EBV positive. Uh, number two, of course, is the IV administration. I mean, the, it's a tiny bit more difficult to arrange for somebody to have IV drug rather than just writing a prescription for a pill. The, the, this is a, the positive side of the IV administration. It, it does actually firm up uh, your control of compliance. And I think this is still a, a more positive than negative. Number three is the cost. I think uh, we're becoming all more aware uh, that when we prescribe drug, we need to also understand what is the cost. Uh, and the cost of, the direct cost of Belatacep are greater. I mean, the whole issue is longer term. If you do decrease cardiovascular events, if you do prolong graph half-life, if you do improve GFR, uh, uh, is then the cost fully justified? But I think that one of the important uh, determinants that has discouraged the use of belatacept has been the higher rejection rate. More importantly, maybe that it, it, when it happens, it's histologically more severe. It's not antibody-mediated rejection, mind you. In fact, antibodies. Uh, DSA are decreased with belatacept, but histologically there is more uh, severe cellular rejection. And so um, I think we're starting to understand uh, that uh, co-stimulation blockade is, is just m uh, much more complex uh, than just looking at CD28 and uh, CD86 or B71. As you can see here in the slide, when you look at the effector cells and the antigen presenting uh, uh, cell, that uh, you, um, uh, uh, that while belatacept binds to the B7 and doesn't allow them to interact with CD28, uh, it, it doesn't, uh, it also doesn't allow the negative pathway, which is PDL1 and CTL4 that binds to B71 and B72. Also, they will not be able to be activated. And the negative pathways are, in some instances, very important. And therefore, 
uh, not activating the negative pathway it could be in some ways as important as the uh, lack of activation of the positive pathway. Uh, for example, Icos ligand can bind to CD28 because it's not bound to uh, Belatacep. So there could be other pathways in the co-stimulation system that could activate the T cells. Now, we are also now understanding that T-Rex will be impacted by Belatacep therapy. Now, uh, the T-Rex uh, depends on uh, activation of CD28 when it binds to uh, B71 and B72. Uh, CD28 is important in the fitness and survival of T-Rex cells, and the same receptors that induce negative signaling in the effector cells play an important role in the T-Rex because uh, if you uh, inhibit their activation, you reduce the su suppressor activities. To make potentially matter worse, when we designed the phase C trial, we used as induction therapy basiliximab, which is, which is a chimeric antibody to the uh, CD25 receptor. And the CD25 receptor is also an important pathway for the activation of T-Rex cells. So all in all, uh, I think the type of regimen that, that was used uh, may have resulted in this greater uh, severity of rejection. So one of the efforts at UCSF has been to look at the drugs, see how they work, understand the regimen, and try mechanistically to uh, put together a regimen that improve the efficacy of co-stimulation blockade. And um, uh, for standard of care, this is a project we we'll worked together with David Harchowski. Uh, uh, we put together a, a, a regimen that we have used so far in maybe uh, two dozen patients that is, is, is supported by excellent uh, data from primate studies. In, in primates, what they have found is that if you get rid of memory cells uh, and uh, if you treat the, the non-human primates with an mTOR inhibitor, that there is great synergism with co-stimulation blockade. So uh, uh, our current protocol, a patient who gets Belatacep at UCSF now, does not, is treated with thymoglobulin and not uh, basiliximab induction. Uh, is treated with the Belatacep, that this is a lower intensity regimen. Uh, we use either five days of steroids or we continue steroids depending on the patient. And then we use Salsep the first four, four weeks, mycophenolic acid, uh, until the patient has completely healed. And after that, then we convert them to Everolimus, an mTOR inhibitor, to, uh, uh, to basically reach out to that synergism that has been reported uh, in several animal models between co-stimulation blockade and uh, mTOR inhibitors. And, uh, and I think uh, so far, at least from our experience, we've had uh, actually in the patients who have been exactly on this protocol, we have had no rejections. Uh, we're also, and this is uh, a study run by uh, uh, Peter Stock and Steve Tomlanovich, we're participating with, a, uh, with Emory in an NIH-sponsored trial, again, to examine various regimen with co-stimulation blockade. Group one is the control arm. Group two, uh, get thymoglobulin, just like our standard of care, uh, but they're maintained on MPA, and then they have steroids uh, withdrawn. Group three is sort of a novel approach, and one of the cells that can undermine co-stimulation blockade and result in rejection is memory cells. And the calcineurin inhibitors are known uh, to inhibit the activity of memory cells. So in group three, uh, we do treat with basiliximab uh, induction and maintain patients on MPA. However, we, we place the patients on uh, uh, tacrolimus for 20 weeks, and then we discontinue tacrolimus. The thought here is that uh, we neutralize the memory cell long enough until the threat of rejection is gone. Uh, on a you know, personal basis, I like to sort of look at the next wave and see whether uh, we can combine uh, Belatacep with the novel agents that really mechanistically and experimentally show synergism. And one pathway that seemed to fit nicely 
with cost simulation blockade is the CD40, CD40 ligand studies. Many years ago, we had an antibody against CD40 ligand, which was associated with thrombotic events because CD40 ligand is expressed on platelets. So now most of the attention has been focused on CD40 that is not expressed on, uh, on uh, platelets. And as you can see from, uh, uh, from this uh, figure, uh, the, the CD40 ligand, CD40 pathway plays an important role. Of course, it's been known for a long time that's important in activating B cells, inducing uh, antibody production, and so on. But it also, through the T cell, uh, uh, the, this pathway in the T cell plays an important role in upregulating uh, CD80, 86, so it helps drive cost stimulation pathway in the T cells, and also the uh, uh, macrophages, monocytes, have uh, CD40 ligands on their surface, and therefore when they're activated, they release cytodestructive cytokines. So inhibiting this pathway is important. And so we go back to a Nature article, which is really one of the important articles in um, experimental transplantation from May 1996. Uh, Chris Larson and Tom Pearson showed that if you block both CD40 and CD28, you can induce permanent uh, graft uh, engraftment. And these are uh, um, mice transplanted with skin, and, and, and uh, uh, the, the combination of using CTL4IG, which is the first generation uh, um, belatacep, plus MRI, which is an anti-CD40 ligand, was the only regimen that induced uh, indefinite graft survival. Similar studies, not inducing tolerance, but resulting in excellent graft survival has been shown in non-human primates uh, with both islets and kidneys. So combining these two agents uh, could actually result in the type of um, excellent engraftment that we're, uh, we're after. And now we have uh, one antibody in clinical uh, trials called ASKP1240. This is a uh, fully human antibody from Estellas. It's an anti-CD40 that is being tested in, uh, in transplant and autoimmune diseases. Again, so when we would administer ASKP1240, it binds to all these CD40s and blocks B cell activation, T cell activation, macrophage activation. So you can see it has widespread potential to be uh, uh, very effective. And this is the first trial in which we gave one dose to look at pharmacokinetics. And, and what we found that with the 200 and the 500 milligram dose, we could induce prolonged occupancy of the CD40 receptor on B cells. The nice thing about this uh, agent also, it did not induce depletion of B cells. And, and I think sometimes there are advantages in non-depleting certain cells because you're on then res less, lesser risk of, uh, of uh, opportunistic infections or PTLD. And now this is a, a, a large uh, phase 2B study that uh, ASKP is being tested in. Now, uh, it's interesting that other companies also are getting into this uh, anti-CD40 game. Uh, Novartis has a fully human anti-CD40, OM111, uh, and I think they have already done a phase one in normal volunteer. And Bristol-Myers has, in fact, a couple of antibodies, both newer antibodies to uh, anti-CD40 ligand and CD40 antibodies. So, you know, I think this whole concept of combining belatacept with anti-CD40 uh, uh, may be coming uh, to the forefront uh, in the not-too-distant future. The other interesting uh, molecule that uh, I think um, uh, has um, promise in terms of combination with the co-stimulation blockade is the IL-6, IL-6 receptor pathway, uh, which is well known to rheumatologists because uh, inhibition of that pathway is an approved therapy in rheumatoid arthritis. So uh, frankly, the, the IL-6 is a uh, really interesting uh, uh, cytokine. It's produced by a, a number of cells, uh, and it produces multiple effects on macrophages, B cell, 
uh, it differentiates uh, T cells into the effector TH17 cells. It affects endothelial cells. Uh, and uh, the IL-6 uh, uh, circulates, binds to the IL-6 receptor on the surface cell membranes. The problem is the IL-6 receptor doesn't have a cytoplasmic tail, so it doesn't signal. So the IL-6 IL receptor combo has to bind to two GP130 molecules, which then produce a signal inside the, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the membrane and activates downstream signaling and, and so on. Now, what is more interesting, though, is that few cells actually express the IL-6 receptor. However, methylloproteinases cleave the IL-6 receptor, and therefore there is a lot of IL-6 receptor and IL-6 in circulation. And so the, the receptor and IL-6 can bind to all the other cells that express the G3130. And almost all cells and all organs express these molecules. So this so-called transsignalings expand IL-6 responsiveness to many cells and many tissues. One example that IL-6 responsiveness is present on tubular cells. And so this is probably through uh, uh, renal tubular cells. So this is likely to be through transsignaling. Now, tocilizumab is a humanized uh, antibody that binds uh, to IL-6 uh, and therefore affects, its, uh, uh, affects the signaling from the IL-6 receptor. Sorry, it's, a, it's an antibody to the IL-6 receptor, so it affects the signaling or, of IL-6 uh, pathway. And uh, tocilizumab has been uh, approved for use in rheumatoid arthritis. So this is a, a, a study in, in mice. It shows the potential. Now, of course, now we always tend to be skeptical about results in mice. Uh, in this study, uh, uh, mice that, were, uh, that received uh, uh, cardiac transplant, whether wild-type mice or w that, w that were uh, IL-6, not out mice, rejected their heart very quickly. Wild-type mice, however, that received CTL4IG had an increase in graft survival. It was good, but not that great. However, the IL-6-deficient mouse, when they also received CTL4IG, had indefinite graft survival. This is one study. There are many others that suggest that uh, when you inhibit both the IL-6 pathway and uh, co-stimulation, uh, that you may actually induce excellent engraftment. And um, do we find IL-6 in, in rejecting kidney disease? Uh, these are studies that we've done with Zoltan and Lasex. Uh, when we've taken kidneys that were normal and we did insight to hybridization for IL-6, we don't find any. Patients who have like borderline rejection, they have few dots. These are very few IL-6. Patients with rejection, though, this is A and B, we see much, much more in situ IL-6 production here. These are in inflammatory cells and these are in tubular cells. And uh, when we combine uh, in situ hybridization with immunofluorescence, where we actually can see every structure, then we can determine more exactly that uh, the, uh, uh, for example, that these uh, IL-6 are present in renal tubular cells while these are in, uh, in uh, inflammatory cells. So we can actually pinpoint the origin of the uh, IL-6 cytokines. So this is a study which just we're about to start to test the effectiveness of IL-6 in uh, patients who have inflammation. So as many of you know, at six months, we get a biopsy on all our recipients. Uh, we refer to these biopsies as management biopsies because, in fact, Upon the finding of these biopsy, we may change the immunosuppression regimen. And so very frequently, we do find inflammation or borderline rejection, and nobody knows how to treat these uh, inflammatory uh, infiltrate, but there have been reports that patients who have inflammation in the kidney may have uh, declining GFR in the subsequent years. So in, the, in this study that we're about to start, and we got the grant from uh, Genetic for this study as well, drug, uh, we're going to be randomizing patients in two groups. Some will treat with IL-6, the other one will follow a standard of care, and then all these patients get rebiopsis six months later to see whether we, could, we got rid of the 
uh, of the rejection. And this is a follow-up study that we have to, uh, that we hope to um, uh, start uh, next year. It basically, a similar study with the tocilizumab. But here we want to add a twist to it, and we want, what we want to do is um, uh, use stratification on the basis of a common rejection module that Mini Sarwal has described. So we add personalized medicine uh, in the way we uh, treat uh, 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 this uh, uh, entity, the borderline rejection. Now, uh, uh, so I think the time has come possibly to start considering a combination of belatacep and IL-6 blockade once we have enough safety from our first uh, study. A few words about TREGS, uh, because UCSS is embarking on several studies on TREGS. Uh, the TREGS are a small subset of T cells, maybe around 5% and they can be distinguished by a variety of markers. The main function of T-Rex is suppress the immune response by either preventing unwarranted immune activation or by resolving the immune response to limit collateral tissue damage. We know that loss of T-Rex due to, for example, FOXP3 mutation leads to lethal autoimmunity in early life if untreated. And, uh, and this is a, just a figure to show that T-Rex play an important role in homeostatic control when there is damage or when uh, there is a breach uh, of uh, the immune uh, homeostatic uh, uh, status. And uh, very importantly, they play a role in so-called infectious tolerance, meaning that uh, uh, regulatory cells promote a milieu a regulatory milieu so that they can expand uh, uh, the network of uh, T-Rex, again, in an effort to control effector cells. So we have, there are two types of T-Rex. There are natural T-Rex. These originally originate in the, uh, in the thymus. And then there are the induced T-Rex. Uh, and the induced T-Rex uh, are, um, uh, are uh, tend to be induced in the periphery and tend to be more antigen specific and they're utilized to expand uh, the reach of the natural uh, T-Rex. Uh, uh, this is a study in, in mice with islet transplant showing the effect of two types of T-Rex, the natural T-Rex, what we call the polyclonal, uh, versus the uh, donor-specific, antigen-specific T-Rex. And as you can see, the top uh, two figures, if I have here, uh, if you, uh, you get excellent graph survival if you use 25 million uh, polyclonal, but you almost get similar survival if you use only 5 million uh, donor spe uh, antigen-specific T-Rex. If you use 5 million uh, polyclonal graft survival decreases quite a bit. However, all these improved survival depend on giving concomitantly drugs that produce depletion of uh, conventional T-Rex or effector, uh, sorry, conventional uh, T cells or effector T cells. So you just can't infuse T-Rex in, in, in an experimental animal and expect the right outcome. You have to modify uh, the immune system. And you know the first uh, graphs here with poor outcome. This is infusion of uh, T-Rex in animals that have not had depletion of T cell of T cells, for example, with cyclophosphamide. So I think what we this puts in perspective that uh, there is a certain balance that you need to deplete the effector cells so that the T-Rex can actually function at maximum efficacy. So several trials at UCSF. We're about to start a pilot trial in th three patients at six months who have inflammation. Uh, uh, we, get the blood, uh, we take a unit of blood, we isolate their T-Rex, we expand them, and this is now in uh, only polyclonal T-Rex, uh, and then we reinfuse a couple hundred millions. This is what the FDA is allowing us in this study. Uh, the one study is, uh, is a study uh, that the Dr. Kang is going to be conducting. This is part of a European network of studies called the ONE study. And here, the purpose is to infuse T-Rex 
which are antigen specific at the time of transplantation. And finally, uh, we hope next year to uh, start a more ambitious uh, TREC trial whereby we will take patients at six months who have inflammation or borderline rejection and then infuse them either with polyclonal TREG, basically non-specific TREGs, or antigen-specific TREGs, uh, and then rebiopsy them at six months and see which of these TREGs are more effective. Uh, because, we can because we can actually um, uh, stain these TREGs or utilize these TREGs with heavy hydrogen deuterium, uh, which is not a, a, a radioactive isotope, we can infuse T-Rex and biopsy the kidneys, let's say, two weeks later. And in fact, by mass spec, we can detect whether the infused T-Rex have gone to the kidney. So this study will, will look at the feasibility and see whether, in fact, T-Rex can control inflammation. And the number three question that we need to answer is whether antigen-specific T-Rex are superior to uh, non-specific TREGs or polyclonal TREGs because the antigen specifics are more difficult to prepare. We have to get B cells from the donors, so this study is going to be done only in living donor transplant. And so it would be uh, more streamlined, probably much cheaper, if the poly TREGs behave or are as efficacious as the antigen specific TREGs. In the last few minutes, I want to give you a follow-up on a topic that I'm sure all of you have been following over the past year as to what is the pathogenesis of FSGS. And as you remember, in a very important article, Nature Medicine was published that uh, the circulating factor of FSGS and recurrent FSGS has been uh, discovered, and it's a urokinase receptor, uh, uh, the, the, sorry, the urokinase uh, plasminogen receptor. And uh, the urokinase uh, um, plasminogen activator receptor consists of three chains, D1, D2, D3. It, does, it, it doesn't, by, on its own, produce any signaling, so it has to bind to ligands. So, of course, one of its substrate is, uh, is urokinase plasminogen activator, uh, resulting in plasmin, ECM degradation, motility of cells, and this whole pathway may be important in cancer. But at the same time, uh, the, um, uh, the urokinase plasminogen activator receptor can bind to the beta-3 integrin. And this is, a, uh, this is the pathway which results in the podocyte in changes in the cytoskeleton. And so if you look at the slide, you see that when SUPAR and this is the urokinase platinum activated receptor, binds to the beta-3 integrin, it activates the so-called GTPases. These are the master regulator of the actin myosin cytoskeleton of the podocyte and, incre and uh, increases their motility. That's why they efface and they produce proteinuria. And, and the data from uh, um, the primary author of the study was really very exciting which, because it showed that only patients with FSGS had high level of SUPAR. This was not a, related to proteinuria. Other proteinuric glomerular diseases did not have high SUPAR. And when they compared patients with recurrent focal and non-recurrent focal, uh, there was higher levels of FSGS in the recurrent versus the non-recurrent. So th this seemed to, to and, and then they paired this with the number of experimental studies that produce convincing evidence that SUPAR is that circulating factor. But you know, life is never as simple. And sure enough, there have been a number of publications. KI just recently had maybe three articles that were by different centers, different investigators, did not find uh, that SUPAR was a marker of SGS. First of all, many found it elevated in different diseases. Uh, one publication found it elevated both primary and secondary uh, FSGS. And, and so we looked at our own data, and we initially uh, did ELISAs for intact SUPAR. Uh, as I said, it, it, it has three chains. And as you can see from this, uh, uh, from, uh, from this figure, we looked at normal control. These are patients without ASRD. 
But then we compared glomerular control, IgA, polycystic kidneys, recurrent, non-recurrent, and we did not really find difference in super levels. But because we knew that uh, there is cleavage of this super molecule, and it can circulate either as the entire molecule or as two other molecules, the D1 and the D2, D3. So we developed ELISAs with antibodies specific for D1 and, and D2 and D3 because uh, there were some reports that maybe it is the fragment D2, D3 that actually that binds to the beta-3 integrin that is the cause of the activa activation. And again, when we run these uh, uh, ELISAs, we found no difference with D1 between FSGS, recurrence, and non-FSGS. And again here, comparing, uh, looking at the D2, D3 fragment, we do not find differences between recurrent, non-recurrent, and glomerular controls. So, uh, you know, I think this whole story was super, seemed to be more complex than what had been reported. And it's possible that SUPAR may have nothing to do with recurrent, with FSGS or recurrent FSGS. So just recently, and this is something that, of course, is of interest to us because of uh, uh, our studies with co-stimulation blockade, Abatacep, which is a first generation Belatacep, it's CTL4IG, uh, uh, was found to uh, be effective in, in, in uh, proteinuric uh, kidney disease patients because they upregulate B71 on their podocytes. And so uh, the, the whole thinking behind this is that uh, the beta-1 integrin, which is important in, in the uh, integrity of the podocyte, is activated uh, when there is a high molecular weight uh, cytoskeleton protein Talin that binds to the B1 chain. B71, if it's upregulated by some mechanism on the podocyte, it binds to B71 and doesn't allow talin to bind to it, and therefore it disrupts the activation of the beta 1 integrin and leads to the uh, uh, fusion of the, of the podocyte, effacement of the podocytes and proteinuria. And so uh, these investigators had four patients uh, whom they biopsied who had FSGS, who had B71, I mean, this is uh, a, um, it's CD80 basically, just as a reminder. And when they treated them with abatacept, uh, their proteinuria got much better. Uh, so they kind of linked the pathogenesis of FSGS with a completely different pathway. And uh, uh, now I have no, at this point, we have no idea how um, B71, beta 1 integrin relates whatsoever to super and beta 3 uh, integrin. Uh, however, when you look at the data in their paper, it looked like most of their um, uh, B71 staining occurred or the most prominent B71 staining occurred in patients with membranous nephropathy and not as prominent in patients with FSGS. I mean, it's there, as you can see, but it's not as, as, as prominent. So the, the investigator, uh, this is their hypothesis that you may have a circulating factor. It could be super, we don't know, it could be something else. It produces glomerular injury. And the, the podocyte then upregulates B71 loses B1 integrin activation, increased migration of the podocytes, proteinuria, and therefore abatacept basically uh, uh, blocks this pathway and can prevent the fusion of the podocytes and the proteinuria. Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly this would be great because we have CTL4IG is already available as subcutaneous uh, formulation for rheumatoid arthritis and belatacep, of course, we use it in, in transplantation. Well, unfortunately, again, nothing is as simple as that. We stained a bunch of uh, biopsies, many biopsies, with FSGS and recurrent FSGS, Dr. Zoltan Lasik did the study, and we did not find B71 upregulated. And uh, Dr. Remuzzi just recently wrote an article to the New England Journal that published the paper said that he had similar experience. He did not find B71 upregulated uh, in FSGS. We do find it in membranous, so, 
but we don't find the B71 actually upregulated in the podocyte. So this whole issue uh, remains to be determined. So, you know, every year I come here and give you talks about immunosuppression and you say, when will one day this end? Well, maybe it will. And, you know, this is from the economist. Uh, uh, so this whole technological disruption may be occurring faster than we think. And the whole, you know, 3D printing and bioprinting is becoming a reality. This issue of the economist actually had print me a Stradivarius. So I had Peggy remove the Stradivarius and put a kidney. And uh, I think while she was doing it, she was like giggling at me, like, what are you thinking now? You're going too far. And in fact, then I, I gave her a press release from a company called Organo Novo that is that announcing that in 2014, they're going to print the first liver. So uh, as I said, you know, these are technologies that are around the corner. But this corner is not as far as you think. And so maybe the day when we can print a kidney, we don't have to worry about immunosuppression, and maybe finally we can resolve the issue of organ shortage. Thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Yep, go ahead, Roger. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm glad you, asked, you answered this. Uh, the question was whether T-Rex can play a role. Liver transplant, by nature, are tolerogenic. Uh, I always ask my fellow on rounds, I said, if you have 100 patients, kidney transplant patients on immunosuppression, and you withdraw immunosuppression, how many will be tolerant? And they usually look at me, they say, well, it's a trick question. I, I tell them I know. They say, some say 20%, 30%. I said, how about less than 1%? I think natural tolerance in the kidney occurs in less than 1%. Now, if you do the same thing with liver, I mean, not right away after transplant late, it, some figures have been between 15 to 20%. So uh, um, uh, Sandy Feng, in fact, is starting a study in children after liver transplant whereby she is going to be infusing tear eggs and trying to withdraw drugs. And so we, I will understand the mechanism of action better once we see whether, in fact, this will facilitate the, the establishment, whether, first of all, it plays a big role in tolerance and whether it can facilitate uh, um, the induction of tolerance. But in previous tolerance signature, in patients with liver transplant, even in kidney, in the few patients with kidney that you find that they have stopped their immunosuppression, they're doing well. The signature there was not that of T-Rex. It was of B cells and so on. So uh, it's unclear what role do they play, uh, at least in this type of uh, tolerance. But maybe if we induce active tolerance with T-Rex, then that, this form of tolerance will be dependent on T-Rex uh, but as it's shown in many experimental models, you really need to deplete the effector space, a T-cell space, in order for the T-reg to be maximally uh, effective.